In the northern hemisphere of every planet suitable for hosting humanoid life as we know it, whether Earth or Klotnos, the tilt of the planetary axis causes seasonal changes that include longer and shorter periods of daylight. As such, every habitable planet has a period when the primary star's rays hit the planet at a shallow angle. These rays are more spread out, which minimizes the amount of energy that hits any given spot. Also, the long nights and short days prevent the planet from warming up in that hemisphere, thus winter. Further, there is a calculable day every year in which the daylight hours are shortest, and the night is the longest. On Earth, this is called the winter solstice. On Klotnos, it is called Ram Nite, the feast of the long night. Celebrations of the lighter days to come and nature's continuing cycle have been common throughout cultures and history with feasts, festivals, and holidays around winter solstices. Although that is perhaps a more optimistic way of looking at it as a people might in a post-scarcity society. Less advanced societies generally see these as lean months with no crops, scarce hunting, and increasingly hungry predators. As such, the need to come together to share resources, seeking the safety of community, and sharing the certainty that the solstice means halfway out of the dark is almost universal. This Ramnete, we will look at some of the various traditions of the season and hopefully gain a better understanding of what it means to a Klingon to be halfway out of the dark. As we have stated, Ram Nite is primarily a winter solstice celebration. In typical Klingon fashion, the name says it all. It is literally a feast celebrating the longest night of the year. That is it. End of story. Okay, not really. Let's dig in a little bit more. Not that we really even need to. For a Klingon, nothing more needs to be said. Klingons don't even need an excuse to enjoy themselves, to drink laugh, eat, and just enjoy life. Further, Klingons generally don't dig too much into the origins of their own traditions. There may be a legend or story about why they do what they do, but it's just accepted at face value and they move on. Klingons tend to not dwell excessively on literal, demonstrable history. So there is little reference in regard to the holiday's origin. As such, we must rely on on a good deal of speculation. Again, as discussed in the introduction, the need for primitive cultures to band together during times of scarcity is almost a universal feature of the formation of any society. It is entirely plausible that the behaviors that were eventually adopted as a formal holiday are the very same ones that gave birth to language, society, and culture among prehistoric Klingons. Indeed, the holiday called Ram Nite may very well have been celebrated by Kailash himself, as well as his ancestors stretching back to a time before the creation of the written language. The Feast of the Long Night creates images of friends and family coming together for a winter feast to share food and exchange gifts. Niteb, Kob, Kad, Jup, Et, Chab, Bet, Shivwit. A warrior does not let a friend face danger alone. And though the changing seasons undoubtedly pose little or no danger in the modern age, surely they did to ancient Klingons, for it is also said, Koch vuvbet shush. The wind does not respect a fool. Fire is a central image, whether it is the glow of a number of Varhama candles to honor the arriving guests, or a mighty blaze in the hearth. Light and heat ward off the darkness and cold. We will discuss this imagery in more detail in the next section. Armies, houses, families, and empires all depend on the collective strength of individuals united together. Wa dol nivdak mate di makap, and Ramnite holds this ideal as a cornerstone, celebrating the greater whole victoriously surviving another year. In the previous section, we mentioned fire and light as central images in the Ram Nite holiday. Perhaps before we examine this symbolism, we must first examine the duality of light and darkness. 
We have previously touched on the archetypical role that darkness almost universally plays in the formation of culture. Seasonal darkness, the shorter daylight hours and longer nights, are associated with colder temperatures, a lack of harvestable vegetation, leaner game for hunting, and increased competition with and danger from predators. By the very process of natural selection, darkness becomes irrevocably tied to fear on a visceral and instinctual level. This hyperarousal reaction to darkness has a strong cultural reinforcement as well for Klingons. The hur invasion, which so drastically impacted and shaped Klingon history, certainly cemented a negative connotation to and perception of space and the galaxy beyond Kotnosh. Space, after all, is a very cold and dark place, and the hur did nothing if not reinforce the idea that only bad things come from that cold darkness. It is little wonder that light and warmth are symbolic of welcoming safety and positivity. These associations seem particularly exemplified in the display of the Var Hama candles to honor the arrival of guests into one's home. While we have no specific account of how the Var Hama were first invented and how they came to hold their traditional significance, in light of what we have discussed, it seems entirely plausible, even probable, that it is tied directly to this concept of warding off darkness with welcoming light. The idea of light unifying Klingons can also be seen in the symbolism of the torch of Ghiboj and the beacon of Kalesh. According to prophecy, the torchbearer would light the beacon to call together the great houses of the empire, who would then unite in the face of a common threat. When the beacon was activated at the beginning of the Federation Klingon War of 2256, the beacon emitted an immense photonic output of over 1 billion lumens per square meter. So intense was the light that it was reported as a new star all over the quadrant. What could be a more fitting Ramnite symbol than a new star in the sky bringing unity to the Klingon people? As with many Klingon traditions, the tradition of eating fish in advance of the Feast of the Long Night can only be speculated at. One popular theory is predicated on the theory that the Feast of the Long Night itself grew out of seasonal scarcity. When crops and game are at a premium, there is one place where sustenance is readily available all year long, underwater. To supplement the stored grains, dried fruits, preserved meats, and farm-raised grach, Klingons harvested the lakes, rivers, and seas of Kotnosh. As the Feast of the Long Night became more of a tradition and less of a symptom of survival, so too did the need to supplement their diet with fish in order to save certain other foods for the Long Night Feast. Thus, the idea of a night of many fish in advance of the Feast of the Long Night is presumed to have become institutionalized. But Klingons aren't Vulcans. They don't go in for logical explanations. They prefer interesting legends. Many Klingons believe that when dishonored warriors die, they take the barge of the dead across blood-red waters of Grathor. These waters are filled with pale serpents known as Koshkari. Since the seasonal scarcity and longer periods of night are archetypically associated with death, it is no wonder that the winter holidays would be associated with these images of the Klingon afterlife. So warriors would go to the lakes and rivers and attempt to drag Goti from the frigid depths with their bare hands, because Klingons. Brandishing bladed gauntlets to punch through the ice, they would grab hold of the Goti swimming beneath the surface and toss them into a receptacle on the ice. In years gone by, this was a sled that could be used to transport the fish back to the mainland. With the advent of transporters and anti-grav conveyances, more permanent ceremonial receptacles were created. After gathering many roti, the warriors would use them to lure a giant garg. Once it appeared, the warriors would attempt to defeat it. They believed this symbolic act would keep the koskari from luring warriors from the way of honor. Or at least that's the legend. The fact is that the legendary Khoskari is entirely based on real creatures. 
And it's not the quantity of Choti that attracts them, but the activity and motion at the surface of the water. These chuch bich dep, as they are colloquially called in some regions, are usually no more than about one uj, approximately 34.83 centimeters. But near the coast, it is not uncommon to see them as large as an uj a, slightly larger than three meters. And while they have not been known to surface except far out in the oceans, deep sea koshkari can grow to the size of Terran whales. A final note on the koshkari. Certain parts of the beast are gathered afterwards and given to friends as gifts. This may seem like a terribly odd custom, even among Klingons, but it may stem from the sharing of resources mentioned previously in regards to the season of scarcity. Ultimately, the variety of seafood is quite varied on the night of many fish. Ramnete botivjaj, Klingan ma, tachjaj.